So welcome everybody to the Anti-Black Racism and Public Health series brought to you by the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health and the Black Health Education Collaborative. My name is Pema Mozumdar and I'm glad to be your host for this series. Um, I'm a Knowledge Translation Specialist at the National Collaborating Center for Determinants of Health. Oops, my slide, <laughs> there we go. I'm a Knowledge Translation Specialist at the National Collaborating Center for uh, the Deter Determinants of Health, which is located in what we now know as Antigonish, Nova Scotia, in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And this territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wulastigwiak peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties do not deal with the surrender um, of land and resources, but in fact recognize Mi'kmaq and Wulastigwiak title and establish the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. While I am speaking on behalf of a center located in Mi'kmaq, I am physically located in Chachake, known as Montreal, on the unceded lands and waters of the Ganyagahake Nation, a place which has served for a long time as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the Ganyagahake of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Abenagi, and Anishinaabeg. I take this land acknowledgement as an invitation to engage with the truth about colonization in what is no, now known as Canada and consider what that means for reconciliation. And recently I've been learning more about who was colonized here. And I've learned that slavery was established in what was, is now known as Quebec, where I live, through a royal mandate by Louis XIV in 1689. And in the years that followed, including when those treaties of peace and friendship were signed in Mi'kmaq, um, Black people were either enslaved or fleeing from being enslaved in what we now know as, as Nova Scotia. So for me, understanding that history of racial and colonial violence and how these systems have manifested harm for both Black and Indigenous peoples is in dis distinct and, and, and significant ways is important because the center that I represent, the NCCDH, recognizes both racism and colonization as drivers of health differences that are both avoidable and profoundly unfair. And so at the NCCDH, we strive to support the public health community in addressing both structural and social determinants of health. And this is to bring about at a societal level, improved health and health inequities, um, improved health and reduced health inequities rather. So um, I just thought it was important uh, on a personal level to kind of um, bring that reflection to this space. And I also wanna very quickly mention that if you wanna know more about the National Collaborating Centers for Public Health, um, there are six of them that each work across Canada, you can go to nccph.ca. We're very happy to be hosting this webinar series in partnership with the Black Health Education Collaborative. And we will continue to support work in this space with the public health community after these webinars. So we have three speakers for this series, for this, um, series um, and they're all featured here on this slide. Dr. Amishri Dryden, Dr. Onye Noram, Samia Abdi, um, you see their faces here. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Dr. Amishri Dryden and Samia Abdi, who are our speakers for this series, uh, for, for this webinar today. Dr. Amishri H. Dryden, she, her, hers, a Black queer femme and associate professor, is the James R. Johnson Chair in Black Canadian Studies, Faculty of Medicine, Interim Director of the newly established Black Studies Research Institute at Dalhousie University, and the co-lead of the new national organization, the Black Health Education Collaborative. Dr. Dryden engages in interdisciplinary scholarship and research that focuses on Black LGBTQI communities, blood donation systems in Canada, anti-Black racism in healthcare, medical education, and Black health curricular content development. Dr. Dryden has published in peer-reviewed journals and book collections, and has an edited collection with Dr. Suzanne Lennon, Disrupting Queer Inclusion, Canadian Homonationalisms and the Politics of Belonging, published by UBC Press in 2015, and the co-authored commentary with Dr. Anya Noram, Time to Dismantle Systemic Anti-Black Racism in Medicine in Canada published in 2021 in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And the article titled, Who Gets to Do Medicine? Black Canadian Studies and Medical Education in the Special Forum on Black Studies in Canada in the academic journal, Topia, Can Canadian Journal of Cultural Studies in 2022. 
Samia Abdi is the executive director of the Black Health Education Collaborative. Over the past 15 years, Samia has been working towards making the public health system more equitable, challenging, and inter challenging intersecting forms of oppression and understanding marginalization in knowledge production, research, and practice. Prior to joining the Black Health Education Collaborative, Samia was the senior program specialist in health equity for Public Health Ontario. Samia has also, also possesses extensive experience in community engaged engagement work, has co-founded international movements such as the Somali Gender Equity Movement and Famine Resisters, alongside local initiatives such as Aspire to Lead and the Toronto Muslim Youth Political Fellowship. Dr. Dryden and Samia, welcome again. It is really wonderful to be with you here today. I'd like to invite Dr. Dryden to speak first, and I'll give a moment for um, the slide deck transition. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, it's, uh, we're thrilled to be working with you on uh, this series of three being, this is the first one. Um, uh, just as an overview, a reminder, these are uh, the, what the three in the webinar will look like. Uh, so today we're focusing on this and then part two will be March 1st and part three will be March 29th. And we're very excited uh, to be engaged in these conversations with you and um, thrilled with the turnout and the commitment to participate. We will begin or I will begin with the um, land acknowledgement. Um, that we use with the Black Health uh, Education Collaborative. Uh, as you know, we're a national organization, and so uh, this is what we use. Um, the Black Health Education Collaborative acknowledges with gratitude the Indigenous people across uh, Turtle Island who continue to thrive and resist colonial violence while striving for self-determination and decolonial futures. We live, work, and play in various territories, including the lands of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas of the Credit River, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, the Anishinaabe on the homeland of the Métis Nation, Gananage, and Mi'kmaq. We remember our ancestors forcibly displanted Africans brought to Turtle Island as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and the histories and legacies of colonialism and neocolonialism, which continue to impact African peoples and the descendants of the black diaspora across the world. We recognize that racial colonial violence harm, harm black and indigenous peoples through both common and distinct logics and actions. We recognize our responsibility and obligations as African peoples to be good guests on these lands. And we offer thanks to our elders and communities from uh, whom we learn. May our wisdom, may your wisdom inform our actions towards a more just future. Uh, like Pema, I am in uh, Nova Scotia, currently in Halifax. So I work, live, and study in Chibukta, Halifax, the traditional unceded territory of the Maliseet, whose ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy nations, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. And as we know, that was about 140 years before the end of slavery in this region we call Canada. For those familiar with Halifax, with Chibuktuk, it was enslaved African people who were used to dig and dig out and build the roads in the city, including much of the citadel. Um, important to note in our in relations between Black and Indigenous people, Afro-Indigenous people, and African Nova Scotian people, on the southern shore of the Bedford Basin, Mi'kmaq people shared land with Black people, and this allowed Africville to be founded in the mid-1800s. Um, and as you know, only later to be demolished by the city government in the 1960s, um, bulldozed to the ground in the middle of the night under, under the guise of public health concerns. We'll talk more about how public health concerns have been wielded against Black people. Um, in this acknowledgement, I honor Indigenous and Black people who continue to be here, who can continue to be in relation with one another in spite of the pervasiveness of anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism, and who together fight against genocide and the afterlives of slavery. I honor Indigenous and Black people, including those who were back in the day and are in the present day, queer, transgender, queer, and true spirit. We stand committed to reconciliation and remain engaged in anti-colonialism and continued disruptions of anti-Black racism. Uh, you know, we, we begin this um, 
2023 Black History Month um, in the wake of the murder of Tyree Nichols. So we hold his loss and this loss in our hearts, notice, uh, noticing uh, that it continues to spark our ongoing work towards building more just worlds um, for Black life. Um, it's important to note that since the death of Mr. George Floyd, um, Black people being murdered by police have increased um, in the United States. And um, I have some data about Canada, which I'll speak about um, a bit later. So uh, for Black History Month uh, and in our work, all Black Lives Matter, including Black, queer, and trans people, and also acknowledging, um, and of course, and including Afro-Indigenous uh, Afro people, and acknowledging um, that we are just coming up to the wrapping of the international decade for people of African descent, uh, created by the United Nations uh, in 2015, but not acted upon, or at least not even acknowledged by Canada until 2018, 2019. Um, and so that kind of uh, mismanaging or misacknowledging carries with it um, an impact in terms of the work that we're doing and, and how we understand Black life and Black people's lives in Canada. So our objectives today are to learn about the Black Health Education Collaborative, identify the historical roots and legacies of anti-Black racism uh, in the field of health, medicine, health, healthcare, um, access to health, understand how anti-Black racism is demonstrated in the current context, and explore critical race theory and intersectionality as it pertains to the structural and social determinants of Black health. Uh, neither Samia or I have uh, any conflicts of interest to disclose. And I will turn this over to Samia. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Pema and Dr. Dryden. Uh, my name is Samia Abdi, and I am located in Toronto, Toronto. Um, so, and thank you, Dr. Dryden, for um, you know starting us off with a land acknowledgement that recognizes um, bo both uh, the um, indigenous um, the two types of colonization, which was one the colonization of the land and the people here. How and, and similarly, the second part of it being uh, the forcible removal of our ancestors uh, from their homeland and um, their enslavement and colonization in this land. Um, so I would like to just go on to uh, share a little bit about the Black um, uh, the Black Health uh, Collaborative and some of our. Um, I'm just trying to. Um, so next slide. So we're a, a group of Black scholars, practitioners committed to transforming how um, health uh, education is done in this country. Uh, particularly, we are focused on um, the medical schools and public health schools, but also expanding very quickly to other healthcare professionals. Um, this is the makeup of our board, uh, Dr. Anya Norm, Dr. Mishra Dryden, Dr. Delia Douglas, um, myself, Samia Abdi, Dr. Barbara Hamilton, Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed and Dr. Keenan Osi Tutu. And if you can see the diversity of uh, and the representation in terms of both um, specialties as well as uh, localities in terms of um, being a national organization. Next. Um, as we know, uh, Black Canadians uh, are the third largest racialized um, group in Canada. We have experienced and continue to experience anti-racism, um, systemic anti-racism in all walks of life. As public health professionals, we understand that our health is not determined only by biology or physiology, but by the conditions that allow for health and wellness to, to be uh, manifested. And uh, the way that um, Black health is experienced is, is in this country is linked to that legacy that we spoke about and will continue to speak about for the next hour or so around slavery and colonization. Um, and in terms of uh, knowing that we continue to be absent from, uh, particularly Black health continues to be absent from how medical and, and public health education curriculum is structured in this uh, country. Uh, some of the work that is coming up um, from the Black Health Alliance is a survey that we've done with um, 
the black health um, school, uh, medical schools across the country and public health across the country, asking the question of how much of their curriculum is focused on um, black health. And you, I don't believe you'll be surprised on how little that is a uh, reality. Our scholarship is uh, based on the critical race theory. And we know that is something that is being barely picked up by, by medical education. And very, very little of that is actually being seen in within public health education. Next. So what we do is this, we have these are the three pillars that we work with, we understand, um, we create platforms to understand black health and black life and know that black health and black life are intricately connected. We draw on a long history of um, community activism and uh, uh, academic scholarships and resistance. Um, Dr. Dryden and many of other our board members have been doing this work over 30 years, but uh, even before then, um, before them, um, academic black academics have been doing this for centuries. So we draw on that lo long legacy of knowledge. We address anti-black racism and interlocking systems that we just mentioned around health, well-being from communities across Canada. Um, our values are linked to our mission. The idea is that blackness and black lives matter. Uh, our ways of knowing are rooted in black and Afrocentric knowledge. Uh, we believe in autonomy and self-determination of black people. We believe in the integrity um, and our ways to navigate how health works in this country with courage. We are uh, big proponents of innovations and different ways of learning and teaching. We believe, and this is of course in our name, we believe in collaboration and building in relationships that are sustainable and that lead into action, not only knowledge. Next. So these are some of the core activities that we've been leading. Um, as some of you might have known, we are working on the first of its kind, uh, Black Health Primer for medical students and public health students. Uh, we are also working on an anti-racism pedagogy, uh, particularly for those in faculty that teach Black health and anti-racism and anti-Black racism work. We offer continuous professional development for cl clinicians, for public health pro professionals and practitioners, similar to the work that we're doing with the NCCDH today. Um, we are working with the Medical Council of Canada to develop national learning objectives in Black health. And we're also uh, about to launch at the end of this month, uh, a community of practice for educators particularly. Next. Uh, these are just examples of some of the research and scholarship that our team and our board and our leadership has been undertaking. Um, we are working on a community voices, um, amazing uh, stories across the board in terms of both of resistance and as well resilience as, and as well as negative experiences that people across the country have had with other, our medical and public health system. Uh, so that will be, uh, that is a project that is underway. We have um, successfully, and this is again for the first time, had an opportunity to uh, usher in um, a special issue on uh, addressing black, anti-black racism and health with the Canadian Medical Journal uh, Association Journal and Dr. Dryden, Dr. Arnia had led a lot of this work and the rest of our board. So you can check out the two um, part um, volumes that came out um, the end of last year in October. Um, so we wanted to also thank, we do work with uh, incredible amount of um, black scholars and leaders across the country and have been, uh, we have a scientific advisory committee, we have um, a community of practice that is coming along, we have external reviewers, so we do not believe in working alone, we are always looking for collaborators and uh, co-conspirators to really um, address and confront anti-black racism systemically and welcome any of you who are on this call to reach out to us for future collaborations. 
So we continue to do this work around, uh, there's also, um, uh, we will continue doing this work and there are some articles underway around that will be published in the Canadian Medical Journal of uh, Education or Journal, the Academic Medicine, um, and continue to center uh, critical race theory and Afrocentric ways and of knowing. And I just wanted to add here that there is a group of um, scholars uh, who uh, we've been in conversation with who will be uh, working with Canadian Public Health Journal um, for a special issue on um, Black health and anti-Black racism. So just, uh, I know it looks very medicine-y here, but we are um, also uh, in groups that are working on this in public health, so. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Samia. Um, so this is a QR code. We're going to go to Mentimeter now, which means I have to do, I have to like stop sharing and then sharing and then all of these things. Um, and of course, <laughs> we are the Black Health Education Collaborative. And so while we are rolling this out, we are starting with medicine and public health. And of course, we have a really vibrant plan to focus on uh, health practitioners broadly, dentistry, pharmacology, physiotherapy, nursing, we're, we're in that. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing this. I hope everybody has accessed the QR code. If you've not, the link is in the chat. So this is your first question. Which of the following um, best describes the racial, ethnic, uh, indigenous community uh, to which you belong? Much like Stats Canada and the work that we've seen through Kaihai, ethno-racial identities, tenuous in terms of the kinds of words we use to describe our own backgrounds. And so in this list, we've attempted to mirror what we see at Kai High and mirror what we see in StatsCan. Um, but honestly, it's to give us a sense in terms of who's in the virtual room, um, who are in your own rooms in terms of decision-making, practices, application, things of that nature. So we have around 607 people who are in the virtual room. We have about 409, 10, um, 11 who uh, answered this question. So let's see if we can get to 500. As I said, there are 607 uh, in the virtual room. Uh, let's see if we can get to 500 in answering this question. Um, so what we what is also important to notice here is if you are decision makers, leaders in the work that you're doing, uh, practitioners in the work that you are engaged in, um, who are you doing that work with? Part of um, engaging and disrupting and identifying and understanding anti-Black racism is, by, is to make visual, if you will, to bring out into the open who is actually sitting around the table? Um, who, what is the ethno-racial diversity of the people sitting around the table? Our decisions around black health, black health protocols, um, Af um, Afrocentric, uh, you know, uh, culturally appropriate protocols that are being put into place, are those decisions being made predominantly by non-black people, non-people of color, white people? is what I meant. And so this, this exercise uh, gives us a sense in terms of who are in our rooms, whether that's physical spaces or virtual spaces. So we're about 469, 470, just wondering if another 30 people out of the 608, sorry, who are in the room um, can also uh, tap into the Mentimeter. Uh, the link to, if you missed the QR code, the link to the Mentimeter is in the chat. Um, is in the chat. And uh, we, will, we will go uh, uh, from there. So 481. So just probably another 15 uh, people, if you can join. And this would be great. It gives us you know, with 609, that's great. And as I said, these are, <laughs> these are very tenuous uh, categories, which speaks to 
um, the ways in which uh, um, when we think about race biology and understanding how racism uh, impacts the body, but most specifically around race biology, um, speaks to that. And look at that, we're at 505. Thank you so much. All right, next question. Which of the following best describes how you were feeling about today's session? I would rather not talk about anti-Black racism. I'm very uncomfortable talking about anti-Black racism. I'm usually uncomfortable talking about anti-Black racism. I'm sometimes uncomfortable talking about anti-Black racism. I'm usually comfortable talking about anti-Black racism, and I'm very comfortable talking about anti-Black racism. So this should also have already advanced on the screen that you were in. Um, if you came out of the Mentimeter, please go back to the chat, to the link. It'll take you back to this question, um, and we can, uh, and then you can start answering this question. So while we do that, I wanted to add a comment uh, regarding just why we asked that question about you know how you're identifying yourself and positioning yourself, um, and as you had a chance to think about that, um, we invite people to approach the work that we do and our engagement over the next hour based on uh, you know their identity. So if you are a white person, you might feel uh, uncomfortable with some of the conversation or triggered, and as you do that, we we welcome you to sit on your own discomfort and um, to channel those feelings into action and to really question why you might be feeling what you're feeling. Um, if you are a Black person, we want to make sure that you, um, you know, take care of yourself as we are um, going to be uh, having uh, this heavy discussion. So it might bring up um, some trauma. Uh, so drink water, is step away if we need to take a break, think about it, uh, but also think about um, sometimes how we perpetuate because racism and anti-Black racism is systemic. So sometimes how we as Black people also sometimes um, normalize and contribute to perpetuating this um, system. Um, the third group is if you are a racialized person or if you're an indigenous person, uh, again, we, we understand that you have also experienced um, a form of racism, but also that is very different than anti-Black racism. So uh, just centering that the Black experience during the next hour or so, we welcome you to do that and to think about where anti-Black racism shows up within your community, within your work, and what role you might play as someone who experiences racism, but also who is not Black and does not experience anti-Black racism. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, I refreshed the page. Apparently, that was my magical tool. Thank you so much, uh, Samia, for that note. Absolutely. Uh, we will, as Samia was saying, we will get into discussions that may be triggering very much um, for uh, Black people as we talk about anti-Black racism and be very uncomfortable uh, for non-Black people to engage in these conversations specifically about anti-Black racism. Now this question, which of the following best describes how you are feeling about today's session? Um, one of the reasons I like Mentimeter is that you actually get to answer as honestly as possible, and this is what we would like. And so if you don't want to talk about it, or if you're not interested in it, now is the time to say those things. We already know that we are engaged with people who do this work, who, will, who remain silent, um, and also aren't, aren't um, interested, nor are, are willing to engage in the work. Um, and it's important for us doing this type of work to be able to identify who those people are so that we can strategize around them. But it's also important for you to identify that for yourself. Is this the work that I wanna do? The work that we are doing here um, isn't, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of data, quite a bit of analysis. Um, that is available to us regarding anti-Black racism. What is missing though, is the willingness to actually engage in the change-making decisions and the change-making actions. And so this question really helps us tap into that. Are you willing to engage in the very real work around addressing anti-Black racism? And for our, our work here, we are specifically talking about anti-Black racism. We're not talking about racism overall, we're talking about the unique and specificities 
of anti-Black racism. Um, and there needs to be space for that. And, um, and I know that this uh, adds to many of the other sessions that the NCCDH is hosting, but in our work, we are specifically talking about anti-Black racism. So we have about 470 people who have responded out of 613. Um, I'm not sure if people have still been able to access it or things of that nature, um, but I am gonna move on. We see the majority of people are some range of rather not talk about it to being uh, uncomfortable and, um, you know, about this, you know, probably just a little less, I'm doing quick math here, um, who are comfortable or who are usually comfortable. This is interesting to see um, because uh, I think sometimes when we get into it, we'll see these numbers shifting a bit, uh, but it's, it's, it's good to see that, you know, at this stage, people are like, yes, let's, let's, let's get into it. Let's do this. All right, I'm going to try again. Let's advance the slide. All right, I went back. I did not advance the slide. No answering the next question. We are going to go back to the uh, PowerPoint slides. Thank you so much. So when we do this kind of work, especially online, I know back, do you remember workshops back in the day when they were in person? Um, so this is what we would like you to do. I wanna thank our colleague and friend, Dr. Stephanie Nixon. Some of you may know, um, may know Stephanie, Dr. Nixon. Um, while we're doing this work, one of the ways to stay engaged, especially in this medium, is to be old school, get a pad and paper, right? Uh, a pad of paper, pen, pencil, um, and, think through these questions. What insights are landing for you as we're working, as we go through this information? How do you feel during, um, during this learning and unlearning? I know we're asking about feelings, uh, but feelings will give us information about where our resistance to learning and unlearning is, or where we are open to learning and unlearning. And also thinking through what are your next steps for learning in action. So, you know, for those of us who have taught in the past or professors um, or who engage in this kind of um, education, we know that learning is not a passive action. And we also know that learning is about taking up the actions yourselves personally, taking up your learning personally. So while we may be, while we are providing you direction and guidance and, you know, pointing you along a particular path, what happens here will solidify for you, become tangible for you as you yourself take it up and try some of these things out and also look for more additional information to expand your own growth and to expand your own skills. So please think of these questions as we move through. So as I was saying, you cannot get to anti-racism. We want to talk, we talk a lot about equity, diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism practice and anti-racism leadership. However, you cannot get to anti-racism without reckoning with anti-Black racism. Anti-racism theory, practice, analytics came out of Black radical tradition, came out of Black radical work um, uh, in terms of structuring it and creating it. Um, and so it's used in a variety of ways now, right, to address racism. Um, and for us in this work, and I would say other work, you can't get there without first reckoning with anti-Black racism. So what is anti-Black racism? Uh, the, the term was coined by Dr. Akua Benjamin, who, who uh, was at, you know, at the university that formerly called Ryerson, which is now Toronto Metropolitan University in Toronto. Um, and she, uh, for those in Ontario or in and around Ontario, you may be familiar with the Stephen Lewis report in the 90s that talks about anti-Black racism. Um, many people attribute that phrase to him, but it's actually Dr. Akua Benjamin. So it's important to make sure we're citing who these uh, terms um, uh, originated from, and because what we'll find is uh, there are a lot of Black voices, Black scholarship um, that are involved in that, that have been taken over by uh, uh, or attributed to white people. So it seeks to, so anti-Black racism, according to Dr. Benjamin, uh, seeks to highlight the unique nature of systemic racism on Black people in Canada and the history, as well as experience of slavery and colonization of people of African descent in Canada. 
Anti-Black racism is defined as policies and practices rooted in Canadian institutions, such as healthcare, education, and justice that mirror and reinforce beliefs, attitudes, prejudice, stereotyping, and or discrimination toward um, people of African descent. Samia. Um, so in the next slide, we just wanted to talk about particularly um, how do we identify me the mechanism of anti-Black racism. Um, um, so as the Michelle was mentioning, anti-racism, particularly um, in Canadian context, we're talking about the institutions, we're talking about institutions like uh, education, healthcare, justice, and this idea of reinforcements of uh, beliefs, prejudice, and stereotypes towards particularly people of African descent. Um, here are a list of books that we um, highly recommend that folks who are interested and um, required to actually do this work, um, you know, pick up and read. Uh, and also there are, um, we are also going to be sending an email with the list of references as well as other additional resources and some homework towards the end. Um, next slide. Um, so we wanted to also um, provide some sort of a mechanism of how to actually approach this work around anti-Black racism and to think about racial and health inequities, particularly in health and how they're experienced. So they're experienced through differential um, care in terms of when once people have actually differential access, so the access to health care uh, depends on your race, as well as differential care. So once the person has access to the health care, how are they treated in that system? And um, more importantly, differential exposure and opportunities, exposure to uh, adverse health care conditions and opportunities for health and well-being. And if we think about uh, what is the underlying factors for all of that, we think about the structural ways that anti-Black racism shows up within um, healthcare and causes racial health inequities. We're thinking about structures that answers the question, so who has this decision-making power? What are these decisions are about? When are they made and how are they made? And to, who, to whom, are, um, whom are they benefiting? If we think about policies in place, these are the specific written policies that allow for people to continuously experience differential health outcomes. So this is the written policies in place. The practices and the norms are uh, what we call um, you know, latent or um, you know, underground kind of undercover ways that uh, racialized uh, racial health inequities show up. So these are the under uh, the unwritten rules, uh, the norms, the, the normalization of um, you know privileging whiteness and white um, ways of doing things and access to white people uh, versus black people. So those are things that are not written in policy. However, they show up in our practice. And finally, the question of the values, the why. Right, And if we go back in the dehumanization of Black people and enslavement of Black people and colonization of Black land, um, including the continent of Africa, um, then the underlying values of why um, come, becomes part of that legacy and continues on into our practices, norms, policies, and the structures we have in place to make those decisions. Next. So in the next slide, we just wanted to also talk about, um, so in the next slide, we wanted to talk about measuring and studying anti-racism. So to understand the impact, so asking the why and the how, again, going back to that structure that we talked about the mechanism, to better understand the impact of structural anti-Black racism, to assess and report the racial inequities, to de develop, modify, and reorient interventions and policies to improve accountability. And for those of you in public health, you will know those uh, mimic uh, some of the public health roles that we know, this idea of identifying, assessing, reporting, reorienting, modifying, developing. Those are the terms that we all um, have to actually study and, and kind of are part of our public health competencies. And if we move to the why or the how do we do that, this idea of um, looking for frameworks, which we will share some today and give you examples. But um, again, this is a journey and, and a one hour to a one hour and a half uh, webinar is not going to do the trick. Um, so there's it's a lot of work that we are inviting people to be part of this journey of learning. So 
understanding that there are frameworks, models that are developed primarily by Black scholars. So finding them, looking them up, understanding them, and using them in our practice, using critical race theory is key to this work. And it's, it's, a, it's a way of doing work, and it's, it's, a, it's a proven scholarship that has very clear methods and approaches and an analytical way of doing the work. Great, thank you so much. Um, and so, uh, you know, we get this question a lot in terms of doing anti-Black racism work, addressing it, focusing on Black health, um, being wanting to, uh, you know, transform uh, the way that we're doing things. Um, and so people are often will say, you know, but they, you know, this one thing happened or this one thing happened and, you know, these things are still happening. So there's two things we need to look at here. We think of Dr. Robin Maynard's uh, book, uh, Policing Black Lives, in which he says the attributes that had been a, uh, attached to blackness, subservience, criminality, lack of intelligence and dangerousness, set up a roadmap for treatment of black people throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And I would say into the 21st century, uh, despite the end of formal bondage, black people's lives would continue to be devalued and their movement subject to surveillance and containment and white settlers and their governments would proactively enforce a racially divided society in which black lives are worth less. So um, we see this, we see this in policing we see this um, in healthcare. If this was not the case, then we would not be seeing the health disparities that we see in healthcare, the access to um, vaccines, the access to um, uh, health practitioners, um, and then what happens once we're there. And then the other part about that, so we see the setup, right? And then the other part about that is, well, why isn't this happening quicker? And I think there are ways that we could make it happen quicker, is that we need to realize that slavery lasted, and this is our colleague and friend, Dr. Natisha Massacoy. Slavery lasted in Canada for about 226 years, and it's only been abolished for about 188 years, 188, 189, because she tweeted this in February 22, 2022, um, 189 years. So according to uh, the calculations, Black people were enslaved in Canada longer than we have been free in Canada. This is important information because often when we think, when we talk about Blackness and anti-Black racism, what we hear is that that's an American problem that was long ago. Um, you know, we assume that Black people in Canada are recent arrivals um, and therefore settlers, and Black people aren't settlers, um, as opposed to without realizing, thinking about it critically, when ships were coming to Turtle Island in the 1600s from Europe, they weren't emptying themselves. They didn't have white people emptying those ships. They had enslaved black people on those ships and doing that kind of, doing that work and other things that were done to enslaved black people. And so we really need to think about this structure, the systemic anti-blackness, the structure of it that serves to erase the realities of anti-black racism, erase uh, the impact of slavery in Canada whilst at the same time claiming that Black people just have an equal access to opportunities and services and uh, the good life, if you will, as everyone else. Um, and that is a form of anti-Black racism. So when we think, and so in order to fully understand, so what I'm talking about there is white supremacy. Um, and in this slide, I wanna thank our colleague and friend, Dr. Eli Manning, who talks about uh, myths of white supremacy in healthcare. Uh, where she where she says it manifests in ways such as we believe that medicine is a benevolent profession. We believe that. We believe people who engage in healthcare are benevolent, that they're good, that they're kind, right? Um, we we you know, there's a belief that healthcare is objective. Um, and that it should be, that it should strive to be objective, that it should only focus on science. Um, there is a belief that uh, Western science is a key source of civilization and advancement. We just believe these things to be true. And we also believe there is this belief that medicine is ethical. And there's a whole host of data and experiences that will contravene all of this. And yet the overall overarching story are these are these um, points here that it's benevolent, that it's objective, uh, that it's the source of civilization and advancement, and that it's ethical. Um, but when we, but another point, another item to think about are 
what do we mean by white supremacy? And again, this is a very small clip of talking about white supremacy. We often think it's what's above the line. And of course we have this image of a iceberg. Um, we think it's this part above the line and we should add police, police violence here, uh, lynching, hate crimes, blackface, the N-word, KKK, racial slurs. That's the only time people can feel that they can say something was racist. Did they call you the N-word? Was there a policy that said no black people allowed? And even then, when you were like, yes, they did, <laughs> or yes, there is, uh, there's still some kind of workaround. Well, maybe it wasn't really racist, but this is often what people think of as uh, racism or white supremacy. But then if you look underneath this, then there are a number of other things that also stand in for white supremacy, assuming that good intentions are enough. Um, denying racism, uh, mass incarceration, the uh, school to prison pipeline, um, you know, the continued uh, racial profiling, treating black children as adults, um, uh, you know, fetishizing, uh, becoming uh, white saviors. These are, you know, you know, believe that all all lives matter. Uh, in uh, to undercut or discount um, Black Lives Matter. So these are just these are the things that start to poke at this I, this idea around benevolence, objectivity, um, and and uh, you know ethics. Where did we see this during the COVID? And you're, many of you must be familiar with this um, report from the Black Health Alliance. And I just really want to touch on this part on the on the right, where we see that um, white supremacy and barriers and systemic anti-Black racism had an impact on Black communities in not only in Toronto, but I have this report, but I would say across the country, um, where lockdown measures fail to have an impact on rising rates in racialized communities, public health measures fail to flatten the curve um, because of underlying systemic inequalities um, and also vaccine rollouts, vaccine access favored um, often urban areas as opposed to uh, uh, rural areas. And this is this 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 happened in Nova Scotia, although there were um, uh, interventions made um, as there were in Ontario, as there were in uh, Winnipeg, there were a number of um, interventions that were made. All right. So Go ahead, uh, Samia. Yeah, so uh, just to continue on some of the numbers that we know that particularly in, in Ontario, communities that are identified as Black, Eastern, Latino, South Asians, Southeast Asians had between four to seven times higher rates of confirmed rate of confirmed cases compared to white Ontarians. We know also um, that there was up to nine times more high, higher rates of hospitalization. Uh, in terms of outcomes um, of uh, hospitalization, we know that up to 10 times uh, racialized people had up to 10 times uh, more ICU admissions than white Ontarians. And ultimately uh, there was 7.6 times more likely um, that a COVID infection had result, would result in fatalities amongst Black and, and other racialized communities in Ontario. So uh, when we talked about differential access, differential care, and then ultimately differential outcome, these are some examples that are um, I guess the most prominent or the ones that are closest to our, our minds um, because we have just coming to the tail end of, of the pandemic. Um, however, these experiences are reflected in every other uh, spaces within our healthcare system. Great, thank you. Gosh, according to the World Health Organization, I'm not sure how close we are to the end of the pandemic, but you know, let's be hopeful, but let's do more uh, intervention things. <laughs> so what is anti-Black racism and how does it manifest in medicine? And let's just say medicine and health. Um, and I and I will speak about both, um, and I'll move through this a bit quickly, um, and then uh, so we can get to uh, something we have waiting. Um, so many people, uh, you know, when we think about Canada and we think about medical education, uh, don't put that in context with um, slavery and colonization. So the first medical education program in Canada opened in 1824. However, slavery in Canada doesn't end until 1834. What does it mean that uh, health education in Canada begins at a time 
and it's prior to that people would go to the United States or the UK and then come to this region. But health education in Canada begins at a time where black people aren't actually considered human. Um, we're experimented on, uh, we are tortured for, uh, you know, medical and health advancement, um, but we, we don't have access to, um, to give consent. Uh, we're often, um, uh, information is withheld from us here. We could think about the experiences with Henrietta Lacks in the United States and um, how uh, they took her cells, her cancer cells, Folks may be familiar with HeLa cells, which have been used to create tamoxifen, which is used for breast cancer treatment um, without being told, without getting any of the benefits. Uh, John Hopkins uh, University Hospital um, has, you know, the people have made millions of dollars on these discoveries and her family has been in abject poverty um, for that entire time. And so um, it's important to note this. The other point I want to say here is because we also get this conversation, I get this as a question is, well, if these things, what happened in Canada? Uh, can you not focus on what happened in the United States? Can you tell us what happened in Canada? It's interesting to me that question because medical advancements or health advancements that happen in the United States are actually used in Canada. It doesn't stop at the border. Um, experimentations, um, research that happens in the United States or the UK actually is used and put to place in Canada. And so this idea somehow that Canada um, is not benefiting or has not been implicated by systemic anti-Black racist practices in medicine and health um, because we, you know, we don't have as many documented uh, cases here, and that's because Canada doesn't like to document these things, um, uh, is questionable uh, because uh, only in that moment do we think, oh, it's not applicable to us, yet all of the advancements from medicine are used here. For example, if we think, if we look at the upper right, we see um, this image with J. Marion Sims, who's considered the godfather of um, gynecology. Uh, Mr. Dr. Sims um, would uh, experiment on enslaved Black women. Uh, he would often purchase enslaved Black women, and he was uh, gifted with enslaved Black women. Much of what we know about gynecology today is because of the experiments he conducted on Betsy Harris, Lucy Zimmerman, and Archer Westcott, just to name three, many others. Um, uh, they, there was a form of pain management available at this time in 1824, right, at this time that the first medical education program opened in Canada, yet they weren't offered to the enslaved Black women he was experimenting on, um, engaging in um, uh, vaginal surgeries, uh, and the enslaved Black women were often punished if they, quote unquote, made too much noise from the pain that they were experiencing. For those who have a familiarity with gynecological surgeries, you may be familiar with the SIMS speculum. It is a type of speculum that's also used in Canada that is named after this person, and it was structured based on uh, the torturous experiments that he conducted on these enslaved Black women. So we see the impact also, we see the outcome also here in Canada. In the bottom right, we have Samuel Cartwright a Southern um, physician plantation owner who in 1851 was trying to explain why it was um, uh, enslaved African people were fleeing slavery. So instead of that, instead of him considering that the perfectly reasonable thing to do, he considered that a form of mental illness that he called drapetomania. Um, they must be mad, he thought, if they're um, fleeing from slavery. He also was somebody who, who worked with developing the spirometer, the way you measure lung capacity um, and, and, um, and creating the, uh, the race differentials in terms of what the lung capacity would be for white people and what the lung capacity would be for black people, which was being used uh, on this side of the border as well. I mentioned Samuel Cartwright here because we still see this kind of racial gaslighting uh, today, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a bit, where when people speak about anti-Black racism, um, as, I, as I said before, we're often told, are you sure, is that actually what happened, as if we're not objective or not 
not objective, we're not capable of, of identifying the racism that's occurring um, because we are too, we are subjective and therefore um, our uh, assessment is questionable. Um, that's a form that's this, that comes out of this line of our, do you even know, is that true? Do you even know what's happening there? In terms of public health, it's important to think about uh, the work, the harm that occurred out of Indian hospitals in quotes throughout Ontario and uh, Winnipeg, sorry, Ontario, Manitoba, and also residential schools. So Indian hospitals, segregated hospitals were created. Initially, it was argued to treat uh, tuberculosis in indigenous communities. They were scaled up through residential schools and became sites uh, where experiments would happen, um, like withholding food, what happens uh, to the body if nutrition isn't given in a particular way. Um, what we know about um, colonialism and public health measures are the ways in which violence and terror, freedom of movement, limited freedom of movement, um, and crime and punishment has been used to um, curtail people's actions, but also get them to comply. And so removing children from their home, placing them in the re at residential school, it's important to acknowledge John and Zippo, uh, a Kruksa man from the indigenous community of South Africa um, was also in residential schools. And so what we, what we see is that and he wasn't the only black person who was in a residential school. We know because of the way slavery works here and the relationships between black and indigenous communities that there were Afro-indigenous children in residential schools and Afro-indigenous people who were in Indian hospitals who were often also being experimented on. Happy to get into more detail, but let's move on. Go ahead, Samia. So one of the things that we wanted to um, at this point to highlight in terms of a takeaway that race is neither scientific nor biological and that health disparities experienced by black people are the product of structural systemic um, injustices for, uh, and violence and oppression. And um, so these are, uh, and these systems are not accidental. Uh, they are not unintentional. They are done by design. Next. Thank you. And so I wanted just to speak uh, for a moment here about um, the afterlife of slavery. So Dr. Sadia Hartman argues that the afterlife of slavery is witnessed through the skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment. And that these, um, and, and it's important to note that. But the other thing she said, which I think is, and this is her book, if you know, again, we have resources. I'm a professor, I'm gonna give you reading lists. Um, <laughs> is she says, and I quote, I too live in the time of slavery, by which I mean, I'm living in the future created by it. And that's where we are right now. We are in the future created, not only by, not by genocide, and colonialism, and that colonialism includes slavery on these lands, the enslavement of African people on these lands. We are living in the future of what was created and what was seeded by those moments. So when we see the health disparities, when we see the mistrust of, from, of public health, of public health measures, it that was seeded through um, slavery, and this is why it's important to know this concept of the afterlife of slavery. Um, so just moving on from that, we're going to change gears a bit. I want to talk a bit about um, objectivity and colorblindness. What we heard a lot during COVID, uh, the beginning part of COVID, 2020, three years ago, um, three years ago, just about now, right, coming into March, uh, we heard across the country, public health chief medical officers, public health officers, saying into the mic that COVID doesn't discriminate and neither do they. And what we know is that COVID was very discriminating looking at those who were most, um, most vulnerable and uh, capitalizing on their vulnerability. But the other thing that we heard them say was that, you know, they treated everybody equally um, and that they were colorblind. They actually said these words, they were colorblind. Um, and now was not the time to look at desegregated data or address 
address um, you know, disparities. Um, and then this is just one example, David Williams, when he said, regardless of race, ethnic, or other backgrounds, uh, everyone is equally important to us. Okay. So when we think about um, uh, colorblindness uh, and objectivity, I want us to think about this image on the right with the elephant, you know, with racism there. We often think professionalism, as we, as I said earlier for Dr. Manning's slide about how we envision health and wellness and, you know, healthcare systems, we believe that in order for it to be um, best, best practice, that one needs to be objective and one needs to be colorblind. However, the ways in which unconscious bias works and white supremacy works, how we even come to understand objectivity and colorblindness is a practice of white privilege and a practice of white supremacy. We think that it's uh, that there is a normal and natural way to, um, to do this work. However, when we are claiming that we're being objective or we're being colorblind, we're actually not doing anything to address the racism uh, that needs to be addressed, as is as you see in this picture with people with their back turned away from the racism. It's not effective, it's not an effective practice, um, and it doesn't do anything to um, disrupt uh, the thing that needs to be disrupted, which is anti-Black racism. So when we turn to the picture on the left, what we're, what, we are, what we're stating here and what the research states and what the practice states is that we must name the thing that, uh, that we are encountering and we must name it in its presence and in its structure. So colorblindness you know, is usually a, a, a claim that is made because um, they, they're usually unaware, people are usually unaware of how racism impacts the lives of black and indigenous people and people of color. And to effectively adjust racism in the workplace and the profession and uh, the protocols, it's necessary to actually engage with how racism manifests in the day to day and how historical issues of racism continue to impact our current moment. We are, as, as the last slide showed us, we're living um, in a long line, a long history, um, a long um, legacy of racism and the outcomes of racism. So as we said earlier, right, 7.5% uh, of the population uh, in Toronto is Black, 3.5% of Canadian population is Black, third largest visible minority group. Um, it's important to note that Black people in Canada are not African Americans, unless, of course, they're from the United States, and therefore they are African Americans or Black Americans. Uh, Black people in Canada are Black people in Canada, people of African descent, African Nova Scotians. Uh, what we know is 43% of Black people in Canada are Canadian born, 8.9% um, are third generation or more Nova Scotia, African Nova Scotian communities, New Brunswick, the southern part of uh, Ontario, Chatham, Dresden. Here we're seeing large historic, long historical uh, Black communities with uh, the longest historical Black community in Nova Scotia, the African Nova Scotians. And some of some people living today in Canada um, are descendants of people who were enslaved in Canada. Um, go ahead. Sam. Um, so some of the things that we wanted to highlight in terms of how does this show up in Canada, actually, because there's, you know, like debunking that myth that uh, this is an American problem, even though we've done all this work so far. Um, is just some of the, the numbers right now that we are um, we, we, we wanted to highlight is that in um, about 20% of Black Canadians reported um, Black Canadians reported living under um, optimal housing conditions, and that is compared to 7.7 .7 of White Canadians. And when we think about the experiences of youth, um, Black Canadians between the age of 12 to 17 have actually reported moderate to severe household food, food insecurities. And that is um, three times more than uh, white Canadians. Equally, and I, I find this particularly uh, an, an important um, uh, stats to highlight that black women are more likely than white women to be unemployed 
or underemployed, regardless of their level of education. So sometimes people think that education, class, or uh, other um, you know social determinants um, kind of outweigh anti-black racism. However, we like to emphasize that anti-black racism is actually a root cause of all other so experience adverse experiences of all, all of the other social determinants of health, whether it's housing, um, encounters with the police, education, or, or employment. So if we think about 8.8% of black women with a university degrees are un un unemployed compared to 5.7% uh, of white women with high school diplomas. Thank you. I'm just, we're, I'm going to skip this slide and move on to the next because I know we're about uh, running out of time and I just have you know, a few things to get to. Uh, so in this slide uh, that I just skipped through, we were talking, it says, it talks about how anti-Black racism gets under our skin. And one of the pieces that we want to talk about here is exposure to racial violence. Um, and what we know in this time of continued police violence uh, is as important to name police violence as a public as a public health crisis. Um, in Toronto, 39.4% of um, use of force incidents are, are against Black people. And as Dr. Natisha Masakoy um, uh, documented, she sat on the committee who collected this data uh, in June 2022. Toronto police officers are 230% more likely to point a firearm at an un unarmed Black person. Uh, uh, as somebody has said already, uh, it's not that we don't have the analysis we do. We now need to start making um, uh, significant uh, transformational changes. But that's important to understand when we come to the social determinants of health, which you're all very familiar with. When, you know, when I share this, um, it's important, uh, for, especially in healthcare, we need to know what makes us sick. And 50% of what makes us sick is the social determinants of health, racism, anti-Black racism, the intersection with uh, homophobia, ableism, classism, access uh, to good food. Are we living in food deserts? Are we underhoused? Um, you know, are we living in multi-generational homes? 25% of what makes us sick is access to healthcare or healthcare systems and wait times. And we've all been hearing about wait, wait times coast to coast to coast. And only 15% of what makes us sick is biology and genetics. And quickly, I wanna to just touch on here that race is, biolog is not a biological truism. Um, it is a, is a social construction. It was created out of racism. Racism created the races. Uh, we, we still see the impact of that today with race biology, this idea that Black people have a different genetic makeup than white people. And this is the conflation of race and genetics. And as we know, um, the diversity of genetics amongst black people, between black and white people is much more diverse, um, is, is much more similar than the genetics amongst black people, which is quite diverse. Um, but also the way that we can, we see race biology or this belief that race and genetics are the same thing is in this use of the language Caucasian, which comes out of 18th and 19th century um, scientific uh, schools of thought that believed that race was real. And one of the ways they categorize, categorize people was using this word Caucasian, and we still use it today when in fact we should be using the word white. So when we think about educating leaders for accountability, one of the things that we need to do is disrupt this race, racial categories, um, which is why you know, we try to move towards more ethno-racial identities as opposed to racial categories. Understanding that racism fueled those categories, the piece I spoke about in terms of race biology and scientific racism, we need to believe that racism exists. I know, you know, we keep, you know, we get asked the question, well, what if people don't believe it? Or what if people want to, um, undermine it or discount it. Um, you will come across decision makers who do that, but just because they do that doesn't mean it's true. We know that racism exists. When decision makers, decision makers or leaders are making those statements, what they're identifying is that they're not good leaders or that they're not good mentors. And our work is to work around that to get the kind of policies and accountability in place that needs to be in place. And so some of that expertise or some of that guidance comes from critical race theory um, and understanding that critical race theory isn't about diversity inclusion. It is about naming the realities of um, critical race theory. Go ahead, Samia. We just have about like five minutes, so go ahead. 
Yeah, so um, we are happy to share some of those definitions, but we just wanted to make sure that we're uh, speaking the same language and that uh, racism is a structure. And also that, that there is, uh, it's state sanctioned and it's a production that allows people to have differential experiences. We've already talked about uh, white supremacy that allows for white privilege and privileged um, access to good services and um, differential experiences of health ultimately. And finally, we wanted to touch on white fragility, which results from people's inability to, um, uh, because of the privilege and the protections that they have led and the protected lives that they have led, uh, being very uh, sensitive towards uh, the word being of racism. So often we experience people get it off, getting more offended by being called a racist as opposed to actually committing access, you know, acts of racism. Uh, and also how um, words sometimes are more important than actually uh, violence that, are, that is um, committed against Black people. Um, so, so in, yeah, in critical race theory, there are four tenets that are important to know. Race is the social construction. Institution systems and policies are designed in ways that reinforce, codify, and perpetuate racism. You all may be familiar with um, it's it's uh, you know the system is working exactly the way it was built to work. Again, this legacy, this um, you know this history, this. Uh, ancestry of slavery and colonialism, uh, that racism is commonplace. And we don't say that to say it's not important, but we say it to say is that it permeates and manifests throughout everything, every day and every moment. Um, and that while racism is perpetuated at structural macro levels, we need to understand that lived experiences, um, the lived experience is essential for understanding how racism works in creating inequities in individual outcomes, including health. So part of the thing we need to think about is what is the significance of racism in contemporary society today? How can we convey that anti-Black racism is a concern that affects all members of society? And how does anti-Black racism continue to function as a persistent force um, in, in healthcare, um, including in uh, public health? And so, um, you know, this we know that these things have happened for sterilization um, and thinking of African knowledge systems, African indigenous knowledge systems as being inferior, um, as opposed to thinking about how can we center the work we're doing in Afrocentric ways of being and learning. So um, we're just gonna <laughs> jump through this, but here's the, we, we will share some of our slides with you, but here's the um, just some work on um, what everyday racism and gaslight and racial gaslighting look like. And um, what are some of the goals around anti-racism? Why are we asking for this? And that is, um, I won't be able to do that with you, but that is because we're thinking about what does anti-racist leadership look like? So for you, I want you to think about who are in the rooms that are making decisions. Who, so we started off with, you know, ethno-racial identities, which isn't perfect, um, as we said, and there were still critiques about it, but of course there should be, um, but we use it as a, as a, as a moment right now. Um, but who's in the room? Who are in the leadership um, decision-making rooms? Who are in those meetings? Who's in attendance? Who's in attendance when you're making decisions around addressing anti-Black racism? Who's not in attendance? Are those, are, are those decisions, um, can those decisions stand based on who is or is not in that room? How do you go about shifting that space? How do you go about, um, you know, reconfiguring that space um, in order to make more sound decisions? And that's not necessarily only having more, you know, ethno-racial diversity in the space, but it also is about thinking outside of objectivity and colorblindness and thinking specifically and directly around what anti-racist thing can we do to make this decision more ap applicable and more effective. And here are just some ways to understand um, roles around Black health um, equity and action around capacity, knowledge, uh, interventions, policies, and partnerships. I know I'm moving quickly, but I do want to make sure we have some time for questions. Um, go ahead, uh, Samia, to this slide. Yeah, so this is just a, a very key um, 
um, we talked about uh, frameworks and models, and this is an excellent model to think about race consciousness within the public health system as a framework. And thinking about these are the four focuses that we can we need to um, bring to light: that racism is a contemporary issue; it's not a historic. Uh, it's something that we are dealing with today. Um, the idea of knowledge and knowledge production, and Dr. Bryan was just talking about whose knowledge are we centering, whose ways of know of knowledge are we uh, bringing forth who's, whose voices are we hearing when it comes to decision making as well as um, uh, the systems and the policies that we're creating. Uh, the third piece being this idea of, of the uh, theoretical conceptualization of uh, racial inequities and uh, particularly in health, the healthcare system and measurements. We just talked about uh, um, uh, in, during COVID race-based data. Are we measuring the right things? Are we dis sharing the segregated data? And finally, this idea of are we having critical approaches and asking the why are we taking for granted the normalized white supremacist ways that we have continued educating ourselves and practicing uh, our, in our field. So this idea of understanding voice, intersectionality, bringing different um, ways of thinking, including Afrocentric ways. Thank you. So, uh, Tap, tap, uh, tapping onto, attaching <laughs> to what uh, Samia just said, what does this mean in the everyday? And it's a question, I, I was a little scattered because I'm trying to catch up to the Q&A and the questions in the chat and all of that. What does that mean in the day to day, right? So this is how white supremacy shows up at work. Perfectionism, sense of urgency, defensiveness, quality over quality, quantity over quality, Worship of the written word, um, only one right way, paternalism, eternalism, either or thinking, hoarding of knowledge, right? Hoarding of knowledge is hoarding of power, fear of open conflict. This is why sometimes people think naming racist action is rude, is um, is unprofessional, when in fact it's not. We, we should be, you know, what's rude is the racism, not the naming of it. Um, you know, uh, being the only one that progress is bigger and more and more. And again, objectivity, the thing we need to um, we need to challenge and this right to comfort. I was uncomfortable. Yes. Talking about anti-black racism is uncomfortable, but it's not violence. Being having your actions uh, recognized as as perpetuating racism may be uncomfortable, may even hurt your feelings but it's not violence. What is violence is the racism that's being perpetuated. So when we think about disrupting white supremacy, here are just some pieces that we could do. Um, uh, I'm just really noticing uh, time. So we'll we'll come back to this in, our, in part two. We'll review these in part two. And then some key takeaways for this session anyway, that racism is a key structural determinant. Sorry, go ahead, Samia. No, no problem. So we just wanted to make sure that we are like kind of closing it off in a good way um, that racism is a key to social determinants of health, that the public health systems need to actively address how entrenched racist practices are, are in our policies and practices. Decolonial and anti-racist action is an ongoing process. It's not something we do in the month of February. And we require this requires an ongoing learning and willingness to take risks and commitment to the long haul. And at the end of the day, when we, this is the tide that raises all ships, when we are committed to anti-racist practice, then everybody benefits. Great, thank you. And uh, so a question for you, your homework, I know if you can take a screenshot, that'd be great. How do we move beyond merely documenting health disparities and disseminating findings in scientific uh, forums and expand professional responsibility to center action and community advocacy? And we're not, I'm, unfortunately, we're not going to get to the Mentimeter, but I might start the next session with this one. So you have some time to think about it. What is your role in addressing anti-Black racism? So you might want to think about that for uh, the next session and we'll start there. And then, as I said before, these are things, some more takeaways. Naming racism is not unprofessional, nor is it rude. Uh, racism is not an opinion. We need to move away from old ways and, and begin new things. And silence really is a betrayal. 
So this is where you can find us at the Black Health Education Collaborative, um, info at bhat.ca, um, on Twitter at Black Health EdC, and of course at our website. Uh, thank you for, I know there were some tech glitches at the beginning. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing and turn this over to Pema. Um, and the pieces that we ran over really quickly, we will absolutely start the next session with. Um, and that will, so we'll go back through that slower and I'll stop sharing here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. I don't know if my mic came off mute at the right time there. So um, that, that there's a lot in there for us to digest. And good thing, we have more in this series. Just as uh, Dr. Dryden just mentioned, we can start off on that note. Um, so thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Dryden and Samia. Um, wonderful to hear from you. I'm going to move us right into a question, because I know time is of the essence. Um, and, and I just... Um, Sorry, I'm trying to share my screen here. There we go. Um, so my question really is, I've been reflecting on Dr. Dryden and Dr. Norum's 2021 um, article in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, uh, The Time to Dismantle Systemic Anti-Black Racism uh, in Medicine in Canada. And there you write about how following the death of George Floyd, the Toronto Board of Health, and soon after several other public health units released statements about anti-Black racism. I also read another article uh, from Scholars in the States analyzing the performative nature of such similar statements um, out of higher education institutes in the United States and little concrete change. So I guess what I'm asking is, in what ways do you see public health leaders and public health um, other, like you've already commented on some medical officers of health and what they've said, but um, different kinds of organizational leaders um, resist the changes that are needed. And, and, and how do you engage with that resistance in a larger context where terms like, and I'm combining a, a participant question here, critical race theory have been weaponized um, by the ideological right? Yeah, Should that's an that? excellent yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and it has been weaponized by the ideo ideological right. Uh, we've seen a lot of it in the United States. No, you can no longer teach African-American history or anything like that. Um, and we, uh, we see it through, um, you know, right wing scholars in Canada as well. So uh, something that I said before, and I'll and I'll hopefully say it um, better here, is there's you know Dr. Sarah Ahmed uh, in her work on belonging and others talks about the performative nature of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what she means by that is sometimes people will say we are committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and think that's it. That's that that it does all the change that needs to be changed, all the work that needs to happen. When in fact that's not that's not the work. It's often a stopgap measure. So we saw a lot of people take a knee. We saw, you know, Justin Trudeau take a knee at the same time that he tried to claim wearing blackface was just a childhood folly and he should have known better. Um, and while at the same time, we don't see any concrete changes um, around addressing anti-Black racism, especially during this decade of people of African descent, other countries have brought in uh, protocols and changes around addressing anti-Black racism, but Canada has not. But the performative nature of taking a knee, oh look, we're taking a knee. You're, so the action that people were engaged in was the very action of murder, and that's not a radical action. Why would we take a knee to simulate the way in which Mr. Floyd died? Why wouldn't we take a fist? Why wouldn't we do something else? And when people did, like Black Lives Matter, Not Another Black Life, they were, we were um, framed as being terrorists and insurgents, as opposed to that being a perfectly responsible response to you know, murder. Um, and we see that same, that the same thing with Tyrese. So what does it mean then when decision makers are saying, you know, um, we hear this a lot as well, I'm here to listen and learn. I'm here to listen and learn. And that's great. Um, we would think that you did that before you became a leader, before you were appointed into a position of decision making. We would think that that would have been the measure upon which the decision was made to put you in a decision-making role. Now is the time for action. And what we're not seeing is the action. What we're seeing is, well, let's have another 
um, let's find out the root cause. We know the root cause. It's systemic anti-Black racism and colonialism. Um, let's have a, let's um, do a review. We know the review. We have all the reviews. We have all of the recommendations, all of the steps that need to be taken. And yet what we see now are people in positions to be able to make those decisions and they're not. And that is the crux of anti-Black racism because where is the willingness, where is the nerve to actually make this change and do something somebody else has not yet done as a way to completely restructure how we even think best practices should look. And that's what we don't have in, in some of our um, decision-making positions. And that's kind of, the, that's the work we're doing. We're like, no, we're just going to do it differently. Yes, there should be this. Yes, there should be that. And it should not have taken this long. Um, and we say the thing that, you know, that uh, is often thought of to be um, abrupt or <laughs> too on point. Uh, but the only way to do that work is to name the thing that's in the way. And that's what we're naming. Um, and so we do see some agencies building into leadership positions um, where leaders need to quantify the steps they have taken that disrupt and confront anti-Black racism. And it's not listening or learning, it's actual steps. I've moved myself out of the way. I, you know, we have restructured even the entire protocol about what we think about A, B, C, D, and E. These are the kinds of things that we need to look at. Um, and last thing, it's frustrating to see um, what happened with COVID and now to see that there's not an anti-racist rollout of Plaxivid. Why is there not an anti-racist rollout of Plaxivid? How, how can we see what happened with COVID and not have an anti-racist rollout of Plaxivid? And by, by not even thinking, oh, perhaps we should do that, is the ways in which systemic anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism continues to fuel um, illness in our communities. Thank you, and that you've named exactly the the kind of ways that resistance to reckoning with anti-Black racism play out and continue to play out. Really appreciate that, uh, Samia. I, I we're at time. Um, I, I want to be able to turn over to um, our our scientific director for some reflection. Um, do you want to take thirty seconds uh, to to add on to what Dr. Dryden has said? <laughs> I think that was excellent. It was, it was a pretty excellent response, but I know you have some excellent things to say. I'm going to take this moment to ask our scientific director, Dr. Claire Becker, to share some reflections. And I know she's going to share my thanks to both of you and to the Black Health Education Collaborative. Thank you, Pema. And you know, I have uh, a lot of notes here and a lot of thoughts, but I'm going to go back to something that you said earlier in your presentation, uh, Dr. Dryden and uh, Samia, and that was asking the questions that Dr. Stephanie Nixon framed. And so I'm going to leave this session with asking them again of this audience and thanking them for coming today, for showing up today, for being part of this conversation. So what insights are landing for you? I asked myself that all the way through this. What insights are landing for me? How do I feel during this learning and unlearning? And I think the most critical question that you, uh, that you brought Stephanie, Dr. Nixon, into this session is what are my next steps for learning? And as you so eloquently just said, uh, Dr. Dry Dryden, for action. Um, so I'll leave those three questions uh, with all of us and uh, as we, we think about that action. And to do something, do something someone has not done yet. So um, I'm going to really think on that one from an action perspective. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone that came today. Thank you to the crew and thank you to our two speakers. So back to you, Pema. Thank you. So I'm just going to um, very quickly ask uh, everybody to rem remember to quick, uh, complete that evaluation form. Uh, you're working in public health and health and related fields. And so you know how important those responses are to us. We really do look at them, use them to guide how we tailor our content and appreciate you with en engaging with us in that way.
Um, and it's available in English and in French. You just have to click the French um, toggle down to be able to take it in French. I'd also uh, like to name for those of us who are still on the line with us that many, many people brought you this series. Um, and so you can read the how to connect with the NCCDH and um, also how to connect with the, with the Black Health Education Collaborative on the slides that you've seen here. But um, the people that have brought you this series at the Black Health Education Collaborative and at the NCCDH um, include you know, she's not here with us to physically or virtually today, but Sumi Ndumbe Eo, my uh, former colleague who um, was with us at the center before um, and is now, of course, uh, with the Black Health Education Collaborative, who really um, had such leadership for um, bringing anti-racism to um, what the NCCDH uh, wanted to focus on more, but that came with its own level of, you know, um, challenge and different kinds of, of, of the, the, the challenge that is doing this work is needing to reckon with anti-racism as a determinant of health and anti-Black racism, um, more specifically in the context of this series. So um, I, I want to thank her. I want to thank everybody from our two center, uh, from our two uh, collaborative and the NCCDH um, who've contributed, um, our speakers, Dr. Dryden and Samia, um, Hannah Claussen, who's done a lot of the logistics along with um, Raha and everybody else from our two teams. So thank you. We will send out um, an email with the evaluation link and uh, some related materials. And some of you have asked, I'm just going to say it here. Yes, this will be recorded and posted um, on, and we will share that information with you as well when it is available. Thank you very much, everybody.